And, well, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll uh, speak without the presentation. There are things that uh, come across more easily visually. But what I wanted to talk to you about this morning, talking about aviation and the energy transition, well, first I'll summarize the first two main founding findings that I wanted to support with a number of graphs. The first one is that what made the industrial revolutions of the 19th and 20th century possible and uh, air transport being an offshoot of that, one of the offshoots that are visible here is uh, the energy revolution. Air transport came about with abundant oil, and so my personal conclusion is that it's going to die off and decline with the decline of abundant oil. And my second finding for this morning is that after growth, we're going to have negative growth. It's not that I'm looking forward to it, but that's how it is. After youth comes old age, old systems are born and die. And so we're going to have to transition towards the negative growth of the aviation sector as for all other sectors. All technology transitions that we're thinking about that need a growth in resources to disseminate, well, these are technological innovations that won't be able to reconcile growth in aviation and um, decline in pressure on the environment or even growth in between aviation and uh, decline in the economy overall. These were my two main findings. I wanted to start with the first one. When you're talking about energy, very often most people have false ideas about the way you need to understand this term. First of all, the first phrase that people use, uh, energy consumption, is not proper. People do not consume energy. The only energy that people consume directly is ambient heat around us so that we don't use too much energy within our food to keep maintain our 37 degree inner temperature and food. The only energy that we consume directly as humans is uh, food and heat transfer from the environment. The energy that we sometimes say that we consume oil and electricity, we do not consume them. It's a misnomer to talk about that because uh, unless I'm mistaken, nobody's ever drunk a bowl of kerosene. I, I advise against it. It would be really bad. Nobody's uh, stuck their hands in an electrical outlet or, or you would have problems and you you're not eating coal uh, unless you're eating activated uh, charcoal because of your uh, feeling bloated. But when you're saying that you consume energy, it's a misnomer. It's not something that you use as such. When you say that you consume energy, and from now on, I'm... I'm inviting you to say that you're taming a machine. Consuming energy is using for your own benefit the mechanical force or the services offered by a machine. So you consume energy by using a car, but in fact what's uh, offering a service is not oil but the car. You're consuming energy when you're pressing the button on the lift, but uh, you're using the um, lift itself and not the electricity. You're not using electricity, but a soup mixer offering mechanical force. And so you're consuming electricity for video conferencing, but what's offering a service is not electricity, but the fact that you can see a picture that represents something that is remote from where you are. So consuming energy is totally improper, as is producing energy. As you probably know, uh, there are a lot of students here from uh, respectable schools and the first law of thermodynamics dynamics prevents energy from being consumed, produced, or destroyed in a closed system. The only thing you can do with energy is transform it. It's the only thing that's within reach. And so consuming energy means that you input energy that's already available, found in the environment, into a converter that can be yourselves for food, that can be an aircraft for flight, and the converter is going to convert the energy that you put into it into something else that you consider 
to be interesting for you. So energy is not consumed by people, and energy in physics, as you probably know, is what quantifies the changes in state in the environment. So consuming energy, uh, put differently, is the use of a converter to change something in the environment. That's what energy consumption is about. So the more energy consumption you, you do, the more you use the converter to modify your environment on a large scale. So the first conclusion you can derive is that the more energy you consume, the more you change something around you, and so by definition, the harder it is to be clean, because if you're clean, uh, if you, it's like going to the bathroom. If you leave it in the state you found it in originally, well, consuming energy is by definition a change of something in the world around you, and so you increase the side effects in the world around you. The energy that we use, i.e. the converters that we use, have changed fundamentally over the last two centuries. You know that sometimes a number of people claim that we can go to a fully renewable world and uh, aviation is no exception because people say that you can only fuel planes with converted uh, beet juice or lemon juice. But, I mean, the world a uh, world that's fully green is the world of up until two centuries ago. Up until now, uh, the world and uh, humans were renewable. We had sailboats made of wood, pushed by the wind, with sails that were made of linen and cotton that were renewable. And even the uh, very beginning of air transport was done with paper. I think that uh, uh, the... Um, Hot air balloon of the Mongol Fear Brothers was made with uh, paper. That's why you have a paper manufacturer named after Mongol Fear and uh, fueled by wood that is re renewable. So we went from renewable to non renewable everywhere. We went from We've moved to non-renewable transport, uh, road, air, maritime, or non-renewable agriculture with uh, fertilizers and uh, tractors that burn oil. So we went from renewable to non-renewable, and that's how the industrial civilization could emerge from non-dispatchable and disseminated sources that are concentrated and dispatchable. Planes do not take off when there is only wind, uh, and but when the pilot decides it, airports are not subject to the wind, to the whims of the wind. They're subject to timetables, and so um, people can just drop their bags on the conveyor to be uh, checked in whenever they want. And so, fossil energy, which accounts for 80% of the world's energy supply, developed because it used converters that were fully dispatchable. Whereas in the past, we depended on the elements, and so we could only produce energy when the elements decided it. It was not a problem when you could store things. So uh, flour can be stored. And, well, uh, you could grind flour when there was wind, but you could store the flour. And so if you can store it, it's uh, not a problem to have a, a lethal source, which is non-dispatchable. But when you can't store, I mean, you can't store an eight-hour flight and saying that you'll unstore it at uh, 3 p.m. So when you start depending, when you want to have a, a, a fully time-based organization, I mean, today's event will start on time and end on time. It won't just happen when there's wind and only then. So fossil fuels have a considerable advantage, and so oil is the king of fossil fuels because it has the highest energy density per unit of volume, and so high energy density per unit of weight. So when you need to get passengers on board to take them far away, oil is unbeatable. Just to give you an order of magnitude, lead acid batteries, so not electric batteries in electric vehicles, but lead acid batteries in the starters of your cars have an energy density of about tens of watt hours per unit of weight, so 30 to 40, whereas oil has an energy density of 10 
kilowatt hours per unit of weight. So it takes a, hundred, a few hundred kilos of uh, lead acid batteries for uh, the equivalent of 1.2 liters of oil. And that's the reason why oil beat all other forms of energy, including electricity, when it was about having long distance transport, because it's the form of energy which lets you take the highest amount of energy with you when you want to travel. So that's why oil reigns supreme in transport. If you look at the amount of oil that we consume, uh, well, it kept growing, and it's also true for air transport. Aviation now consumes roughly twice as much oil as in 1980. In 1980, air transport consumed 4 billion barrels per per day of oil in a world that consumed 60, and now air transport consumes 8. In 2019, it consumed 8 million barrels per day, doubling up in a world that went to 100. So air transport, so its amounts of oil consumed grow faster than the overall consumption of oil in the world, which is another way to say that air transport has a growing share in the amount of oil that we consume. And here we are really putting the finger on the uh, everything you can say about the potential switch uh, that we have more efficient engines, you consume less per passenger, but neither in aviation nor in any other um, sector can uh, unit efficiency translate into uh, less pollution. So you can save a bit per kilometer or per seat for the same thrust, but uh, we're not using it to fly the same number of people whilst consuming less oil. We'll simply fly more people and uh, so traffic growth goes faster than the unit decline in consumption or emissions. And as Valerie said a minute ago, we need to think in terms of carbon budget. The planet, because of resources that are finite or because of the atmosphere, the atmosphere does not care about our ratios. The only thing that the planet sees is the total amount of emissions or the total amount of oil taken out of fields that are not renewable. It's the only thing that the planet knows. So so it's our responsibility to make sure the, these unit efficiency gains uh, are reflected into overall consumption declines, and if that has to go through traffic declines, so be it. Work has been done jointly by the ship project, the shift project, and Super Hero de Carbo, which has just been published in early March. Flying in 2050, that you can find easily on the website of the shift project, and even with a very optimistic scenario in terms of technology, there are two scenarios that were explored. One, which is a bit nasty, on the others that I called. Uh, uh, completely a pie in the sky. Uh, I don't believe that we can have that level of savings. And the second scenario, uh, well, it's not within reach either, but it's a bit more reasonable. But still, especially I think that this scenario is not compatible with the economic negative growth that I was talking about earlier. Even in a scenario where you have hydrogen planes that Mr. Le Maire likes so much, you still have to go through a decline in air traffic right now if you want to aviate if you want aviation to meet its carbon budget by 2050. And so therefore, uh, I mean, th th there's something very important that you have to keep in mind. Uh, up until now, and that's true both for aircraft but computers, automobiles, uh, houses, and the manufacturing industry, nowhere has unit efficiency translated into less consumption for aircraft. There's something else to be added, and that is that very often one tends to t think in terms of uh, uh, units of distance traveled, but I think the right approach, and that was, uh, I mean, a PhD. Uh, student, uh, Mr. Bigot, has mentioned this. What you should measure is the, is the time spent traveling. What human biology tells you that there are some constants if you look at the the, the, the history of their uh, movements and on the day.
daily basis, we, we travel three times a day. Ever since there have been statistics on the movement of human beings, we find that there are three movements per day. That is, times when you leave your home to uh, go shopping, go to work, or see friends, or go to the... Uh, you, uh, movies if uh, <laughs> when that was still possible. So that constant is like three uh, trips a day, three movements, three displacements. That has been the case for the past six years. On average, people leave their home three times a day. So what you you cannot bring this down. I mean, you can't. Uh, I mean, if you stay in one place uh, at all times, the, you know, your house turns into a, a jail. No, the idea is to uh, have um, less time spent. Uh, moving or traveling. And then the average time spent, uh, say, for going to work, is has been more or less constant for the past few decades. And so if you enable people to have more efficient modes of transportation, if they can go faster, well, what you'll find is that you might not end up uh, at the same place if you save time. You'll still have the same time uh, budget, and uh, you will travel as much. And that applies for short distances and long dis distances. And so when you compare aircraft and other uh, modes of transportation, the big difference is in number of time uh, hours spent traveling, because our, our biology means that you can spend a few hours traveling on a uh, on a plane, on, on a car. I mean, nobody will uh, spend a week on the, on a, in a car or on a train or on a plane. Uh, what happens if you, uh, when you uh, take a mode of transportation, you're prepared to spend a few hours at most? And that is the same whether you're traveling by car, by train, uh, or by plane. Um, and so the right mode of com comparison, if you compare the plane to the aircraft with other modes of transportation, um, you don't think in terms of miles traveled, but you think in terms of number of hours spent traveling. And so therefore, I mean, because every movement or every trip is about the same. And so there, uh, you have a ratio of 1 to 10 comparing aircraft and other modes of transportation. If you uh, go on board a, a plane, you sign up to uh, use uh, 10 times more, uh, say, fuel or CO2 than on any other mode of transportation. So when you fly, uh, when you take a plane, it means, uh, and uh, usually you travel uh, for leisure, three quarters of uh, aircraft transportation is for leisure. You've decided to uh, go on holiday or visit friends uh, by emitting and consuming 10 times more than if you had traveled by car uh, or by train. I mean, the, the, the difference with trains is even more uh, spectacular. In any case, uh, energy consumption, well, that means, uh, well, you want to control machines. And uh, there's an order of magnitude you have to keep in mind. As I speak to you now, uh, the entire uh, install capacity of machines on Earth, I mean, uh, all the machines doing something. And so that could be uh, public works, uh, machinery, or uh, washing machines, or trains, or uh, lifts, uh, elevators, or uh, boats, or vacuum cleaners, uh, or uh, uh, in the in the timber industry, you have uh, machines uh, uh, rolling out uh, tree trunks, etc. All these machines, including machines that uh, uh, filtrate water or, or the, the, uh, the stamping presses, the mechanical power is several hundred times the power of mankind. In other words, the, the install capacity of machines on Earth that can operate on Earth with the energy we give them to eat, uh, that is fuel, uh, we they were able to uh, multiply by several a factor of several hundreds the uh, mus muscular power of, uh, of man, of, of mankind. And so thanks to machine and so thanks to uh, uh, energy and f fossil fuel energy, uh, this was multiplied by uh, uh, several hundredfold. And th 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 there's a huge economic implication here. Uh, the economy is a system of transformation. I mean, the economy 
is a productive system in which uh, you take natural resources and you turn them into something else, which you consider it to be to have more value for mankind. As I speak, uh, I use uh, glasses uh, to look at my screen, and these glasses were made using natural resources and uh, sand, or I don't know if but like uh, polycarbonate. Well, no, that's uh, organic chemistry. Never mind. Um, but uh, you find that uh, oil uh, sitting in an oil field has less value uh, than the uh, glasses I have on my nose uh, that I'm wearing. And so you transform natural resources into turn you turn them into something else. And uh, by and large, uh, if you look at all the services made available by the economic system, is basically natural resource uh, transformed by our activity, or more more to the point by the activity of machines. And so all the objects, just uh, all the objects have, were made, built, uh, uh, condition, packed uh, uh, by other machines. I mean, the computer I use is a case in point. And um, these machines uh, produce uh, for men. And uh, if uh, we have... Uh, time uh, to spend on a webinar on the future of, uh, of uh, air transport is because we, I mean, instead of spending two-thirds of our time making or preparing food, I mean, that's uh, two-thirds of the population uh, spend the whole time producing food. Uh, that was 100 years ago. And the rest uh, build uh, furniture or, or clothes. And there were very few services, a few bankers, a few uh, a few vicars, and that was that, a few employees, uh, uh, servants. But um, the reason we moved uh, from uh, service to transportation to, well, you move on to urban civilization is because machines do the work in our stead. Machines were able to turn uh, mankind around, uh, turn mankind into sort of a giant Iron Man uh, with a mechanical power, which is uh, just a flabbergasting compared to what uh, human beings could do. And the whole point uh, here is that, I mean, if you quantify the economy, you you uh, well, you count things in the euros or dollars, but you could have worked it out in, in joules or, or kilowatt hours. And, uh, and so we have a huge transformation system, starting with natural resources to produce goods and services that we use, including, indeed, aircraft uh, and, 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 uh, and airports. Now, the big implication of, all, of it all is that when you look at uh, the way the world economy uh, was created based in terms of uh, uh, energy used by mankind, you have a straight line. Of, if you look over the past uh, 60 years, if you look at the development of the, the global GDP in constant dollars compared with the total amount of energy used in the world, it's a straight line. It's, there's a direct linear correlation, uh, and that's true all over the world. The reason why China, which was always considered was always more, more popular than France, had a smaller GDP than France it was simply because uh, uh, for a short period of time, uh, France uh, had more machines than China. But when the Chinese uh, caught up with France, um, or when they just, well, the, the GDP, of course, uh, grew accordingly. Uh, there you have it. Having said that, there's something important to remember. The size of global GDP depends on the world uh, energy supply, and that energy supply, 80% of it is made up of uh, fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels have a specific feature, namely that they take hundreds of millions of years to form coal. Uh, that we use today um, is a derivative or a residue of plants that uh, grew at the uh, Carbonifier that ended 300 million years ago. And gas and oil are um, uh, residues of uh, seaweeds and plankton that uh, survived at a time anywhere between 400 and 50 million years ago. That's a long time ago. And so these, th this is simply not renewable in any time. Uh, uh, scale. Uh, we have basically a stock of uh, fossil fuel uh, that is there once and for all. And simple mathematical simulations so that when you start tapping into this, 
uh, annual extraction from that uh, from that stock has to meet three boundary conditions. It has to be zero at minus and plus infinity, and uh, there, it, there reach, uh, you reach a speak somewhere in between. And so when you start tapping into uh, that sort of uh, uh, well uh, deposit, but that applies to uh, titanium, uh, tantalium, or gold or silver, once you pull anything out of uh, Earth that uh, that is worth zero at minus infinity, zero at plus infinity, and a peak somewhere in between. And so there's a there's a peak hole that just uh, uh, there was a peak in uh, uh, silver, uh, gold, uh, uh, nickel, and such like. And uh, if you look at the uh, the table of uh, Mendel, uh, well any item on that the table of elements will go through the same. So the question is that peak any where near uh, present day? Is it high or low compared to where we are? And can we find a substitute? Regarding all the three indicators are uh, on the wrong side. If you look at, well, apart from shale oil uh, and, uh, and uh, in the US and Canada, is the, the peak uh, ahead of us? No, it's behind us in 2018, the uh, International Energy Agency uh, took note of the fact that uh, all, uh, peak oil had been reached in 2008, and there's a direct relation with the subprime crisis, which was an, an energy crisis, even though not everybody realized this. Um, and uh, ever since then, uh, production has declined. Um, now, to maintain uh, production, you had um, uh, shale oil coming from the US and shale sands, uh, oil sands from Canada, but these are poor quality oils because uh, the, you spend a lot of energy extracting that oil, and so there's uh, well, there's one economic consequence for uh, shale oil. Uh, shale oil producers never made money uh, with that kind of oil. If you know the terms, uh, we look at an industry in the U.S. which had negative cash flow uh, from the start, except in 2020, paradoxically, because uh, operators were able to make money. You might ask, how were they able to make money when the price of oil plummeted? Well, the simple reason a uh, shell oil well is a Dirac fraction. That is, you 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 fracture uh, the uh, the stone underneath uh, the uh, the surface, and all the the shale oil will come out in one go. One year after it's been uh, it's put in operation, uh, production uh, is uh, cut by a factor of five or six, and most of it comes out in the very first year. So if you want to have a constant uh, production coming from a field, a deposit of uh, that uh, uh, mother load, uh, you need to just drill new uh, new new wells to sink new wells of uh, of all. And uh, in 2020, uh, our shell oil operators stopped build, uh, uh, drilling these uh, these wells, so they, they saved on investment. But they had the tail end of existing. Uh, wells and so uh, production came down, but costs came down even faster. And as a result, using the remainder of uh, uh, the output, they made money. And so the paradox is that you can make money only when uh, production goes down. But for the economy as a whole, you have growth only when production increases because uh, oil is the blood, as it were, the lifeblood of uh, machines that uh, transport things. And since these machines are the the uh, uh, the, the lifeline of uh, the world economy. Well, you can see that over the past 40 years, there's a chart showing this. Uh, GDP variation over the world is an exact reflection of uh, all uh, production, sometimes uh, lagging uh, two, uh, two years because uh, oil brings oil. You don't have economic growth coming from Mars. And that's maybe why well, uh, Elon Musk wants to go to planet Mars because he thinks he can drive the economy from from there. Uh, it's not that you have more money because there's more oil. It's the other way around. We have uh, energy that will transform more resources. And then, as a result, uh, you have an increasing GDP. And so the most limiting, limiting factor to economic growth, and has been the case for the past 40 years, not the number of people working or people. There are no, too many people on Earth. That's where there's unemployment everywhere. Unemployment is no longer a limiting factor. It's not human capital. Uh, the 
the uh, uh, manufacturing capacities now uh, are underused um, and uh, financial capital uh, is not the issue. There's uh, too much money around uh, uh, ever since quantitative easing. Um, there's no shortage of cash. No, the real limiting factor for the economy is the fuel for machines, the, 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 and that is uh, the amount of uh, oil, gas, uh, and uh, coal that can be fed to machines. So you said there's a glut uh, in terms of uh, climate terms, but we are at the wrong point uh, in Europe and uh, in the Western world at large. We find ourselves in a position where we have too much fossil fuel to keep within the two degrees of the Paris Agreement, and yet not enough to go anywhere near uh, economic growth. And so if we are uh, content with the geological decline of oil, that will simply not be fast enough. But conversely, it will go. Uh, I mean, this will happen at such a pace that the global economy will decline. And um, uh, my uh, bet is that the uh, European economy will not go back to uh, this, its pre-COVID levels, which was already close to what it was back in 2007. Uh, peak oil uh, has already happened. Right then, now, uh, and to uh, complete this presentation, let me just say uh, in a few take-home messages, uh, energy is what uh, makes the world go around. Thanks to machines, we have a global GDP 200 times higher than if we only had men and women using their bare hands. Well, say 100, but uh, that's the order of magnitude. The amount of energy willy-nilly will have to uh, come down on the fossil fuel end. Uh, renewable energies will not be able to compensate because uh, because these are energies you're pulling out of and not uh, uh, energies you're uh, going towards. All the uh, uh, the exciting energies, uh, windmills and uh, solar panels are based and made with using uh, fossil fuel. Uh, nuclear energy is, uh, has too long a way to go to be a substitute for fossil fuels, and it finds itself in uh, a, a the context of uh, well, uh, hostility, but also there's an issue of uh, free uh, markets. I mean, the nuclear energy needs a uh, regulated uh, context and cannot go in a sort of uh, free-for-all um, uh, capitalist system. And so the global economy is not going to grow over the next 30 years. And it is in this context, that especially uh, for the uh, well, for the Western Western economy, and it is in this context that we have to bring down the consumption of fossil fuels to ensure uh, that the climate doesn't uh, play unexpected tricks on us. When I say unexpected, I mean, we, we have some idea, uh, even though there will be surprises along the line. Because, um, surprises cannot be uh, foreseen. And the consequences uh, will not be continuous. It will be sort of a step-by-step uh, a step step situation. Uh, and that's the context of the uh, airport in, uh, air transport industry. Let me just remind you that, uh, uh, of course, for most people, tra air transportation uh, is for leisure. I mean, of course, you have uh, very uh, skilled engineers working on this, but it's mostly for leisure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc, for this uh, presentation. Excellent and hard-hitting, as usual. You are oh, one of those uh, speakers who can actually make a presentation, even when their PowerPoint doesn't appear and yet make their message very clear indeed. So thank you for that.